as we wait for the last couple people to, to perhaps trickle in, let me point out, uh, if you haven't noticed already, um, we're, we're sort of officially announcing uh, the fact that on the April 8th total solar eclipse here in town, um, we will be hosting a watch party at the stadium, at the Dwight Perry Football Stadium. Um, and so, uh, Weather permitting, please join us and your closest 20,000 or so friends uh, because we may have a full house. Um, everybody, uh, all the students on campus, faculty, staff are invited, alumni, visitors, people driving down I-75, I look for a place to watch. You're all invited and everybody who attends will get a free set of uh, eclipse glasses. So um, we wanna make sure that everybody has the opportunity to enjoy uh, and enjoy safely the viewing of the total solar eclipse. And because uh, as we'll see today, the, the spectacle plays out over a few hours, the traffic may play out over a good chunk of the day. We wanna give lots of opportunities for people to do activities, to have fun. Uh, and so we're gonna have lots of eclipse related educational activities. Um, and so we're currently uh, working with students and student groups across campus and faculty to put together activities to engage us, inform us, entertain us on the day of the eclipse. Um, and so if you know any students or are a student uh, and, and want to participate, uh, let me know. We'll get you on board. We'll find something fun for you to do, or you can think of something to do uh, on your own. I will just go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no well, okay, come on. I was just killing time. <laughs> no problem. All right. Again, thanks everyone for sticking around or for coming to the uh, lecture tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andy Layden, uh, who is chair of the physics and astronomy department here at BGSU. And I'll talk a little bit about his uh, background here. Uh, so, Andy uh, got his interest in astronomy. Uh, really, I guess in college, um, got hooked on astronomy in college, but had some interest before that. And uh, this was while he was at Wesleyan University. <clears throat> and then uh, after graduating in 1986, he was at Yale for a little bit, uh, and then got a PhD in astronomy in 1993. Uh, and then followed that up with some postdocs, uh, including in Chile and Canada and in Michigan. And uh, then after um, a little bit, landed at BGSU and uh, has been here since then uh, and has uh, come to really enjoy eclipses, including, I think, seeing a couple uh, total solar eclipses, sort of serendipitously being in the right place or nearby at the right time. And uh, so it's my, again, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andy Layton. Thanks, Dave. So um, yeah, I get I get excited about eclipses, uh, as as Kate mentioned. Um, I, I've seen a few. Hmm. There we go. Um, I've seen a few. Am I speaking too softly? Or oh, okay. Uh, I, I've seen a few eclipses, um, and uh, I've I've always had to travel to them. This eclipse will be the first time when the eclipse has come to me. So I'm excited about this. Um, so excited, in fact, I forgot to shave this morning. So I'm sorry you're, you're seeing the scruffy uh, Andy Layden. Um, I wanted to share uh, the experiences that I've had uh, and, and kind of help you understand what to expect when it's eclipsing. And in particular, I wanna share with you uh, my thoughts, my predictions, I guess at some level, about the shape and structure of this sort of ghostly pearlescent white corona as it's called that always surrounds the sun but most of the time you don't get to see it because the bright surface of the sun washes it out um, these are some of the topics that i'll talk about tonight um, kind of uh reviewing some of the the phases of the eclipse and introducing some terms about different layers in the surface or atmosphere of the sun talk about the appearance of the corona during several different total solar eclipses over recent decades. Um, talk about why those eclipse uh, 
corona appearance varies from one eclipse to the next. Um, and then we'll talk about how one might view the corona outside of eclipses when it's not eclipsing um, from space. And we'll talk a little bit in the end about the solar physics, the magnetohydrodynamics, the relationship between magnetic fields, fluid motion, and the gas on the sun, and how that gas uh, flows out through the solar system to call to create what we call the solar wind, how it interacts with the Earth uh, and in what we call uh, solar weather. So let me just dive right in. Um, during our eclipse experience this uh, April, we expect uh, a total duration of about two and a half hours uh, from the start of the eclipse over here when the moon first touches the bright disk of the sun. It will progress over the course of about an hour and a quarter until we get a precious few minutes, about three minutes from Bowling Green here, of totality when the moon's dark disk completely covers the bright surface of the sun and the corona shines out. So this, this uh, again, pearlescent white uh, outer atmosphere of the sun is called the corona, the bright surface of the sun that's in fact too bright to look at with your unaided eye, with your unprotected eye. Uh, it's called the photosphere. Um, we've got some uh, eclipse glasses. You've probably seen these sorts of things before um, that you can wear uh, and look up directly at the bright photosphere of the sun during the eclipse, during the partial phases of the eclipse. But the important news is well, you may have experience, let me back up and say, you may have experience observing eclipses that way from 2017. If you were in Bowling Green, we had a beautiful partial solar eclipse where the moon partially covered, but never completely covered the surface of the sun. And we saw lots of people using their eclipse glasses safely and correctly then. Um, we will do that as well here, but that experience that you may have enjoyed is like night and day compared to a total solar eclipse when the moon totally covers the surface of the sun and we get to see the corona for that brief, precious few minutes. Take off your eclipse glasses. It is perfectly safe to look at uh, the totally eclipsed sun. But once the moon continues on its way and lets the photosphere shine out again, we need to get those eclipse glasses back on. It's very tempting to continue to watch, but Safety says get the eclipse glasses back on. So we're we're working hard to be consistently uh, informing people about safe solar observing. Um, I've got another layer of the sun's atmosphere that I'll introduce briefly here. It's called the chromosphere. Chromo meaning colorful. Um, and in this total eclipse picture, you can see one or maybe another uh, sort of pinkish red blobs of light. It's a little bit hard to see maybe on the projected image up there, um, but uh, that is the chromosphere, the sort of mid-layer of the sun's uh, atmosphere peeking out. So we've got these three layers of the, the sun, uh, photosphere, corona, and uh, chromosphere that are available for us to look at. Um, before I go farther into that, let me let me show you on a map uh, where the eclipse is happening, where the moon's shadow is passing. So uh, down here in the southern Pacific Ocean um, is where the moon's shadow first lands. Um, there's two components to the shadow, a very deep, complete shadow, and then I've depicted the the partial shadow called the penumbra here by this uh, this um, gray circle. And as the eclipse takes place, the shadow is going to move this way across the United States, across Mexico, the United States, and Canada, and we will be treated to all of these different uh, phases of the eclipse. Um, so let me see if I can do this uh, animation and talk at the same time. Um, as the eclipse starts in the Pacific Ocean and starts moving, um, we will be here in Ohio seeing the full uneclipsed sun. 
you can watch it with your glasses as you want. When that gray shadow first starts, we get here and it gets deeper and deeper until the main shadow crosses and we get totality. And then the moon's shadow recedes until we see just the last touch there. So it's the process of the moon's shadow playing out across the surface of the earth that creates uh, from any one position like Bowling Green, this sequence of eclipse events. Um, so th that's kind of a, a, a nice way, a global way of thinking about how the eclipse uh, plays out. As we're getting very close as the last sliver of the photosphere of the bright surface of the sun is being eclipsed by the moon's dark shadow, um, we get a couple of particularly exciting treats. And I want you to expect and look for this if we're treated to the eclipse. Um, the first one uh, that I'll talk about is called the diamond ring effect. Um, that last little sliver shines brightly like a diamond as the corona starts to be visible around the dark. And I can't tell you how profoundly deep and dark the, 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 the unlit side of the moon is. It's just stunning and beautiful how dark it is against the, the corona glowing around it. Um, and this beautiful diamond ring effect. Um, you tend to see this in the last 10 or so seconds before the moon completely covers the photosphere. It can be before or it can be afterwards. Um, and so the, the diamond ring effect uh, is visible. It's not visible with every eclipse. There's some variability there, um, but you need to watch carefully for it because it only lasts for a couple seconds. It's very fleeting. Even more fleeting potentially is another effect called Bailey's beads. Um, it might just be a few seconds in some cases. And what we're seeing here is um, the, the photosphere shining brightly through a couple of valleys, maybe interrupted by some mountains on the surface of the moon. Remember, the moon's not a perfect sphere or disk. It has hills and valleys, craters, right? And that topology on the surface of the moon is always a little bit different. You can't quite predict, uh, or at least I can't, uh, when and how Bailey's beads will appear before or after the moon moves across. So you have to be watching especially carefully for that very short, brief moment um, when Bailey's beads appears. And then, oh, let me back up and talk uh, for a moment uh, about the bright surface of the sun, that photosphere, that light sphere um, that, that we see. Um, it, it is, as we say, too bright to look at, um, but with proper protection, you can look at it and, and see some details potentially. Certainly with a telescope, you can see these sun spots. Um, and we intend to have uh, several telescopes um, at the eclipse event fitted out with big versions of the eclipse glasses so that we can uh, allow you to look through them directly if you're at the event. Um, we're also gonna have some at the observatory on top of this building with video cameras that will stream that uh, video uh, to the jumbotron at the stadium. If all our technology works well, fingers are crossed, we're working on that still, stepping through that. Um, also, uh, we're hoping to send it out to WBGU and perhaps some of the local TV affiliates will pick up our feed as well. Um, so uh, we're hoping that we get some regional and national, perhaps even coverage of our images from Bowling Green. Um, but we should be able to see these sun spots um, if they're present on the surface. Um, when you zoom in and look at them carefully, there's a, a usually a dark central spot and then a less dark region around it. Um, and uh, this is places where magnetic fields in the sun, remember I talked about magnetohydrodynamics a little while ago, this is where this first crops up. Uh, it's found that on the surface of the sun, magnetic fields loop up out and loop back into the sun. And in the places where those magnetic fields cross the photosphere, the bright surface of the sun, they tend to trap the gas. It can't 
move away. It can't escape. It just sits there and it still shines its light. It still gets rid of its energy. And so it cools off and it gets darker. It looks black in these images, but the gas there is still very hot. It's still glowing very brightly. It's just that in comparison to the even hotter and brighter photosphere around it, it looks dark. So the sunspots are our first indication that there are these magnetic fields in play on the surface of the sun. Um, they also are fun to watch because if you uh, take a picture of the sun on one day, come back another day, the spots will all have moved a little bit. And the next day they will have moved a little farther and a little farther and a little farther. You can, you can determine that the sun is a sphere that's rotating. The sun has um, an axis, a North Pole and a South Pole, and the sun has an equator and the whole globe of the sun is rotating. And it takes about 30 days for the sun to complete one rotation. A big sunspot group like this may survive long enough so it goes all the way around the backside of the sun and reappears over here and comes back around for another month. So observing the sunspots can be fun if you're patient and you've got that telescopic view. Okay, that's the photosphere. Those are the highlights of the photosphere. The chromosphere, that uh, colorful sphere or layer, atmospheric layer, uh, is interesting to look at too. Um, it's always present. It's always uh, potentially visible, but usually, at least to our eyes, the bright photosphere below it washes it out. Um, so you need a special filter, even more special than the eclipse glasses, uh, more expensive, <laughs> special means expensive in this case. Um, so it's really usually professional astronomers have this uh, equipment around, um, but it allows you to see the light glowing from hydrogen specifically, hydrogen gas in this upper layer of the atmosphere. And it's often given this uh, pink color because the hydrogen glows as we'll actually see later with this characteristic pink color. The places where the sunspots are sprouting up through the surface, uh, those, those magnetic loops uh, shine brightly. And some of the darker spots are places where cooler gas is present. Uh, oftentimes the loops jut out against the space uh, and against the darkness of space behind, the gas glows and you can see it as one of these prominences. They, they're prominent uh, even around the edge of the moon when it covers the sun in a total solar eclipse. So these pink prominences uh, are something that we can watch for. So the chromosphere, uh, it can be interesting uh, and can be part of a total solar eclipse, but it's really the corona that is uh, the more majestic thing, again, against the black uh, darkness of the, of the unlit side of the moon. Um, and I'm afraid that photographs really don't do it justice, uh, in part because the corona varies in brightness so much from one place to another. Um, Fred Espinak is a, a, an incredible observer of eclipses, both as a professional and as an amateur. Um, he's wearing his amateur hat in these pictures. He chases after eclipses with his small telescope and camera um, and posts uh, the pictures on his website, Mr. Eclipse. Dot com. I encourage you to check out MrEclipse.com. He's got decades worth of beautiful total solar eclipse photographs. And many of what I'm going to show you tonight are, are his work. Um, back in the eclipse of 1991, um, he uh, took this series of photographs with different exposure times. <laughs> he opened the shutter on his camera behind his telescope for 1 60th of, of a second. And the brightest light of the inner corona shone through, and he was able to capture the, the shape and structure of that. He then quickly took another slightly longer exposure, a quarter of a second exposure time, to get the middle corona 
and another photograph with two seconds of exposure time to get the faint outer corona. And the sequence of the photographs allows you to kind of see piece by piece how the corona looks. But he then went ahead and digitized the photographic film uh, and combined them essentially in Photoshop um, and adjusted the levels of the different photographs so that he produced this photograph, which is a better depiction of what your eye would see during a total solar eclipse, if you were present there. You can see there's a, a prominence here and a prominence here. There are these sort of streamers extending away in the corona, some brighter, some fainter. Um, and so with this combined photograph, uh, you can see uh, the details, the structure in the corona a little bit more clearly, um, and the chromosphere, right, the prominences. Um, he also, <clears throat> once they're in Photoshop, the 14 photos the computer combined, he can play with the contrast and make the structure even more evident than your eye would see, right? You can really see sharp edges to this streamer here, uh, to this streamer down here. Um, and you can really see the beauty uh, of this structure. Um, I wanna remind you, of course, that the sun um, is a sphere, is a sphere, um, and so it has a three-dimensional structure. And these streamers may start uh, at the surface of the sun and extend out and then stretch away in this direction or this way or behind or towards you, upwards, downwards, right? It's a, it's a three-dimensional sort of structure. And in our photograph, we're seeing it all projected onto one uh, plane, one geometric plane, if you will. Um, so uh, these streamers that you see here uh, have been known as, uh, been dubbed helmet streamers. Uh, as people think about ancient helmets, right, that a warrior would wear on their hat. And I particularly like this Turkish one uh, that really has that same shape. Um, and think that, you know, there's the metal structure and then the empty place inside where you put your head. This has a bright sort of outer region and the inside uh, is a little bit empty, not completely empty, but there's less gas there. It's shining less brightly in there. Um, so that's the, the, the name helmet is, is given this type of streamer. And all of these pictures that I've shown you so far from this one eclipse uh, that, uh, that Fred Espinak observed uh, in 1991. Let me uh, show you some other ones too. Uh, here's one of his eclipse photos. Uh, again, it's a combination of eight photographs uh, combined in the computer, not enhanced this time. So this is what your eye would have seen. Uh, it didn't reproduce super well here. It's got the sort of pixelated uh, version. Uh, but this was a few years later, an eclipse in 1995. And you can see that the, the structure has changed, right? We've got streamers that come out this way at the equator of the sun. So we call them equatorial streamers specifically, as opposed to ones that go out in any old direction. These ones tend to be bigger and more substantial, right? And then we've got this sort of brush-like effect that happens at the North Pole and at the South Pole. And so they've been termed polar brushes. Uh, and, and so this is a different sort of uh, shape, structure. Um, it, it's reminiscent a little bit of the magnetic field that you get around a bar magnet, right? With a North Pole and a South Magnetic Pole. And you might think about magnetic field lines making a shape like this. If you had iron filings and shook them, they would line up along the magnetic field lines, sort of like little compasses, and you'd get this pattern. We're sort of seeing that same pattern just on a very much bigger scale. We don't think that there's a bar magnet inside the sun. Things are a little bit more complicated. We can talk about that afterwards if you like, but it's got that same shape um, that's known as a dipole. Two poles, right, on the on the bar magnet, two poles on the sun, a north and south. 
And so we've got that simple, well understood magnetic uh, three dimensional shape in this particular eclipse in 1995. Here's a different eclipse in 2001. Eight photos, computer combined. This is about what your eye would see. And you can see it, it, lots of little streamers this time, almost like petals on a sunflower. More like the first eclipse, but distinct in its own way, right? Here's yet another eclipse in 2006. 26 photos, computer combined. So this is, again, a pretty good depiction of what your eye would see. There are some streamers, but a lot of activity along the equator and polar brushes. So this is more like the dipole structure. And in 2019, just a couple of years ago, um, Mr. Eclipse started using uh, a digital SLR camera instead of a photographic film camera. So he could take a lot more and it was a lot easier to get them into the computer and combine them. So you get this really gorgeous pattern of equatorial streamers and polar brushes. It's got that dipole structure, like a bar magnet. You can also see just a hint here of maybe a prominence. So um, I know we've got later in the uh, in the lecture series, uh, one of our faculty talking about astrophotography, and I'll let him carry on more with the details of how astrophotography is carried out. Um, uh, but these are some excellent examples. And uh, we want to understand what's behind, right? What's the why of these two different behaviors? Um, so here, I've started to show you uh, measurements that astronomers have made over a long period of time, uh, taken by looking at the sun with their telescopes and counting the number of sunspots. And we'd take a picture on one sunny day and count them up. We'd wait for the next sunny day and count them up. The sun would rotate a bit. After a few weeks, we would see the spots on the back side of the sun and then the spots that were on the front side would come back. And so if we average our counts over the course of a month, if we create a monthly average sunspot number, that's a pretty good indicator of the total amount of activity, solar activity, magnetic activity, if you wanna call it that, uh, on the sun in a global, rather not just a little localized, how many, how many dark spots are there here or on this side of the sun. And what you see is that sunspot number plotted as a function of time or date goes down and up again and down and up again and down and up again. And it repeats over and over after the decade after decade. The time between two peaks is typically about 11 years. Sometimes it's a little longer, sometimes it's a little shorter. It's not like clockwork and sometimes some cycles it's higher and some cycles it's lower and sometimes it's in between. There's a lot of complexity in the sun's magnetic field and its magnetic activity, um, but there is some general behavior. And so scientists talk about cycle 19, sunspot cycle 20, we're in 25 now. These little tags here show you where those five eclipses that I just pointed out are. The 1991 eclipse that I showed you multiple times in the first sequence um, was taken at a time when the sunspot count was near its maximum. 240 spots was the average sunspot number when that eclipse occurred. The next eclipse, the 1995 eclipse, occurred when the sun looked much more like this, a blank, almost no so spots. Uh, the count was about 31. And then at the next eclipse in 2001, the sunspot number was back up, not quite as high, 203 as opposed to 240, but still near the sunspot maximum, looking more like this. The 2006 eclipse was close to, but a little bit before the maximum sunspot number was 17. And then the last one that I showed you, that really beautiful dipole one, um, was at a 
dead minimum when there were effectively no spots at all on the sun. Um, and so we got that really beautiful pattern then. I wanted to show you a picture of what the sun looked like in the 1958 eclipse when the sunspot number was at one of the highest levels in recorded history. That should be an interesting story, right? Uh, a special case. The sunspot number was uh, 250 or more. And I started looking online and Mr. Eclipse was a little boy at that time, so he wasn't taking pictures yet. Um, so I scoured the internet as best I could. Um, and I just really couldn't find anything until I bumped into uh, an old Super 8 video, I think it was, uh, taken in, in uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, by a, a, an astronomer, actually. Um, and the, the folks at the university there recently uh, digitized the video and uploaded it to YouTube. So I'll show that, to, I'll show you the whole video at the end if you wanna stay around. Um, but this is one frame that I clipped out of it from the 1958 uh, super maximum sunspot. And unfortunately, it's pretty blurry. Um, if you're watching the video, you can see a little bit more of the detail, but you can see it does have that very radial sunflower type appearance. So let's, let's try to make sense of it. Here, we've got the 1958 sunspot maximum video, the 1991 and the 2001, and we get these sort of flower type pattern, I'll call it the flower pattern, um, in the sunspot, or uh, sorry, in the corona shape and structure when we're at a sunspot maximum, when there's a lot of spots, when there's a lot of magnetic, magnetic activity on the sun. Um, we get at sunspot minimum, these three eclipses, the 95, 2006, and the beautiful 2019 eclipse, the equatorial streamers and the polar brush, we get the dipole pattern showing up. So that's the pattern, right? The, the appearance of the corona, the shape and structure of the sun's corona is tied closely to where we are in the sunspot cycle. So here's the sunspot cycle from present back through the big 1958 peak back through the 1900s and 1800s, back to about 1750. Astronomers have been very keen on observing sunspots for many centuries. Um, and the one that just passed is here. Um, I pulled this data off just last week. Um, here is the sunspot number at that 2019 beautiful dipole uh, sunspot minimum when the number was near zero. And in 2020, 21, 22, 23, the sunspot number has been ramping up again. The dashed line and the dotted line are two predictions of where the sunspot number is likely to go based on understanding of a couple of different groups of solar physicists. And you can see they don't agree entirely, but there is some general agreement that the sunspot maximum is close. Um, in December of 23, the last full month I guess as of today, maybe there's another month, maybe January has been posted, but uh, last week, that December was the last full month. The sunspot number was kind of at an, an anemic 114, not the 200 levels, not the 300 levels that we were looking at previously. So it's kind of a weak sunspot, but our April 2024 eclipse should be right near the maximum sunspot number. So what does that mean? What do we predict for the shape and structure of the uh, corona? I'm guessing it's going to look sort of like uh, the sunflower pattern that we saw in, in 2006. Um, that was kind of a, a low sunspot number just after uh, low sunspot, a weak sunspot maximum. We'll see that radial shape, the sunflower shape. Um, here you can see one, two, uh, maybe there's a third prominence. So I'm hoping we'll get to see some pinky red prominences poking up above the, the edge of the sun's dark disk. Um, and in the time before and after the solar eclipse, uh, 
hopefully we'll be able to see a large number of sunspots on the surface of the sun in the photosphere of the sun. So there should be a lot of good things to look for at this eclipse. Um, that's kind of fun, you know? It's not gonna look exactly like this. Everyone is unique, but I'm predicting it'll look somewhat like this. So that's what we can see from the ground. Going into space helps us see in a different way. Um, for two particular reasons. Um, if the sun is over here and the earth is over here, um, the earth's atmosphere, while it's nice, right? Gives us air to breathe. Um, it also means that the light coming from the sun has to pass through the earth's atmosphere. And in doing that, it gets blurred a little bit. So if we can get our telescopes up into space on a spacecraft, we can get a clearer picture of the sun and the corona. Um, we can also uh, block the sun anytime we want because the air is not there kind of getting in the way, I guess. Um, we can put a, a disc inside the telescope at our spacecraft and block the sun and we can observe the sun uh, and its corona anytime we want. And so spacecraft have been produced by uh, NASA and other countries, NASA uh, and Japan uh, worked together to create uh, the earlier generation uh, spacecraft called Yoko. Uh, and then there was a generation uh, a spacecraft called Soho. That's one's shown here. Um, and you can see uh, when it's uh, in its last stages of development here on the ground, it's a couple people high. It's not a very large uh, spacecraft. And it's got a bunch of different telescopes that observe the light uh, of the sun in different wavelengths and different colors. So it can take lots of different types of pictures. In particular, um, when we're above the Earth's atmosphere, we can also look at different types of light like ultraviolet or UV light, extreme UV light, which has even more energy. It comes from hotter gas and X-rays. The sun emits, and in particular, the sun's corona emits all those types of high energy light uh, in addition to the visible light that we've been showing so far. And so we get windows into the, the sun's appearance and, and the, the physics that's happening on the sun by spacecraft observing in these different wavelengths. We can't see them here on the earth because thankfully, the earth's atmosphere absorbs and blocks all of those high energy, potentially damaging uh, kinds of, of radiation from the sun. Um, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is another case. Um, all of these observatories orbit around the earth, above the earth's atmosphere, but um, they're, they're close to home. And, and that's good, it's, it's easy and, and efficient and inexpensive, relatively speaking, to get them there. Um, another pair of spacecraft called Stereo A and B um, were launched and put into slightly different orbits. Stereo A got put on a slightly smaller orbit than the Earth, and that means it goes a little bit faster around the sun. It completes one loop around in less than a year. So it's always getting a little bit ahead of the sun. Stereo B was launched into a higher orbit, so it takes longer to go around the sun and it constantly gets farther behind. And the, the uh, importance of having two additional spacecraft is as we look at the sun and its three dimensional streamers, we look at it from two different perspectives, like looking at the world from two different eyes. We get a stereoscopic view of the sun and we can pick out more clearly its three-dimensional shape. So that's stereo A and B, still observing from about the same distance as the sun, kind of standing back and looking uh, from a distance. The Parker Solar Probe is a different story and I'll come to that story in just a minute. Let me show you a few of the pictures that are taken by these spacecraft first. Um, the photosphere, the visible light of the bright surface of the sun. This is taken by the uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory. And this is a picture that I downloaded uh, about a week ago uh, in visible light. Shows those sunspots 
and kind of a, a, a granularity to the surface that's associated with essentially the, the boiling, the hot rising and fall and cool falling gas on the surface of the sun, um, like, like in a boiling pot. But you can imagine that with the higher crispness, the higher resolution of a space uh, image, we can understand what's going on with the sunspots better. Um, we can make measurements that tell us that the, the surface gas in the photosphere is about 6,000 Kelvin, that's sort of a metric unit, uh, about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's hot. And uh, I, will, I will call it relatively dense, though it's actually less dense than the air in this room. Um, but in comparison to the chromosphere and the corona, the higher layers of the sun's atmosphere, it is relatively dense. Um, the gas is made of hydrogen and helium. And of course, we've got those sunspots, those places where the gas is cooled and is less bright, trapped in magnetic loops, and they help us see the 30-day rotation of the sun. So this is sort of the, the characteristics, the physical properties of the photosphere. The Solar Dynamical Observatory has observed in extreme ultraviolet light, quite close to the X-ray region. Um, and what we're seeing here is gas that's a little bit higher above the photosphere, glowing at a temperature of about 2 million degrees Fahrenheit. Really hot, but really low density gas. Still composed of hydrogen and helium and just a little bit of other things. And interestingly, when you look carefully at what the sun is made of, you see all the elements that you find here on the earth, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, silicon, iron, but it's so hot that it's a gas on the surface of the sun. All of those things are present. We've got these dark coronal holes as they're called, places where the gas is cooler, less dense, and it turns out that gas is free to flow away from the sun in what we call the solar wind from these coronal holes. The bright regions here, you can really trace out the magnetic loops quite clearly. They shine brightly, they're hot, there are more gas there, and they tend to be over the sunspots. They're the same loops that cause the dark sunspots. The magnetic fields jut up out of the surface and they're, they're held in place by the dense gas of the photosphere. But as they reach the lower density gas higher up, they vibrate and that vibration shakes and heats the particles, the hydrogen and helium atoms in the corona, explaining at least in part, the high temperatures that we encounter there. Again, this is that hottest, brightest inner corona that we would see in our photographs. The outer corona can be observed with spacecraft too, uh, using that, um, that disc, that I mentioned inside the telescope, the, the blue disc here, blocks the bright light of the photosphere. This is the size of the sun, right? We're blocking out that region so that we can view the, uh, the white visible light that we would see during an eclipse, but we can see it anytime we want. This is an image taken by the SOHO LASCO instrument um, and again, it's that pearly white light, still a temperature of something like 2,000, uh, sorry, 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, um, still that hot, low density hydrogen and helium gas. But now we can pick out the solar streamers going very far away, many, many solar radii away from the sun. And what we realize as we study these coronagraph pictures is that um, the white light corona, the visible light corona, isn't glowing, isn't producing its own light in the way that the photosphere is. Um, what it's really doing is um, the, the electrons, the electrically charged, negatively charged particles in this super hot gas are scattering sunlight from the photosphere. The visible light from the photosphere sh uh, shines out and tries to escape 
but it might bump into an electron and bounce back towards us. Shine away into space, but encounter electron and bounce back to us. So we're kind of seeing the, the scattered light of the photosphere. Again, the streamers appear over magnetic loops and they're places where uh, as those loops expand and break, gas gets thrown out into space in what's called coronal mass ejections. The gas, the mass of gas gets thrown out um, and creates gusts in the solar wind. And at the end, I'll try to show you a quick video of one of these gusts uh, taking place as observed by SOHO's LASCO camera. Notice that you can also see some planets in this video, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, and Mercury, some stars, a little mini constellation or asterism called the Pleiades. Um, and uh, so, right, we're just looking out into space in the direction of the sun, and we see whatever happens to be there in visible light. So it's a great way of, of looking at the shape and structure of the corona anytime um, and, and seeing it evolve and change day to day. Um, where do I get those numbers from is a good question, right? How do I know that the photosphere is 6,000 Kelvin or 10,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit? How do I know that the corona uh, is a couple million degrees Fahrenheit? Um, the answer comes from uh, a study, a way of studying light called spectroscopy. And if you pull out your little uh, clear plastic sheets, I know some of them you were, you were looking through them and, and seeing the pretty rainbows. We're gonna study that a little bit now. Um, so I've got a regular old light bulb here. As I turn it on, um, I can control the amount of electricity going through the light bulb. And so you can see I've got a long skinny filament. It's not frosted, so you can directly see the filament, see what's going on. Um, as I give it more electricity, there's more heating in the light bulb and the metal glows brighter and brighter. The more electricity, the more temperature, the brighter the glow. And it also changes color a little bit, doesn't it? It goes from kind of a red to an orange to a yellow. Um, and crank it up pretty high to white. So if you look with your um, with your square at this light, um, I hope you can see on either side of the light a um, a rainbow, right? If it's appearing above and below, rotate your sheet ninety degrees so that you see it off to the sides. That gives us a common way of talking about it. Do you see blue towards the light? And then green, yellow, orange, red, the, the Roy G. Biv of, the, of the, the light or the rainbow spectrum. That's a characteristic of anything that is hot and dense, right? The, the metal particles in my, the metal atoms in my tungsten filament are tied up against each other. And when I make them hot, they bang into each other and they emit light. Um, and because they're constantly colliding with each other, uh, because they're dense, they they produce this continuous rainbow spectrum. Let me contrast. That, that's sort of like what the the photosphere looks like. I'm going to contrast that with another light source that I have here. Um, this is a long, skinny tube. It looks very much like a neon tube. It's the same design. Um, it's had all the air pumped out of it and just a little bit of a different gas pumped in um, called hydrogen. Um, and so as I send electricity through this, it excites the hydrogen gas particles um, and they glow in that pinky glow that we saw the prominences shining with in the, in the chromosphere. So this is my simulation of the chromosphere and it's somewhat like the corona as well. I'm gonna turn off this light bulb so it doesn't confuse us. Um, use your uh, sheet, your diffraction grating to take a spectrum to do spectroscopy of this hydrogen gas, hot hydrogen gas, excited hydrogen gas. Tilt it so that everybody gets a chance to look. Some folks over there. Some folks over here. Different, right? Do you see lines, bright lines, different colors? 
The different colors correspond to different wavelengths, to different electrons. Um, we were talking about how electrons and light are, are related after the, uh, after the, the great uh, planetarium show that we saw. And so the pattern and color and brightness of each of those lines is a characteristic, a fingerprint, if you will, of um, hydrogen gas. It's glowing low density, hot hydrogen gas. Um, I could, I, I won't, but I could put in a tube of helium and we would see a different set of lines. A tube of neon has yet, yet a different set of lines. Every chemical element on the periodic table has a unique set of lines. And so by sitting back on the earth and using our telescopes and our gratings to take a spectrum of this type of material, um, Kate, I think we can bring the lights back up. We can study, we can identify what gases are present in the sun, it's mainly hydrogen and helium, though everything else is there in, in, in small amounts. Um, and we can also uh, figure out the temperature so and, and the density at some level. So here's, here's a simulation of the photosphere. And you can see I've got lots and lots of little points, each representing a particle. They're close together and they're pretty hot, right? So they're, each particle is moving around and bumping into its neighbors talking to them, smoothing out, evening out. Um, and the speed that they move at is related to the temperature. So I would say that in terms of the sun, they're moving at a relatively low speed, indicating a relatively low temperature. But there's a lot of particles. I'm not even going to try to draw every particle's arrow. Some are shorter, some are longer, right? Every dot on here needs to have uh, an arrow indicating what direction and what speed it's going. And there's so many of them, and they're all glowing at the same time. There's a high energy. If you add up all the energy of all the different particles, a uh, high energy, and it glows brightly like the photosphere of the sun. The corona only has a few particles, but they're moving really fast. So I'll indicate them with really long arrows. And that fast motion means there's a high temperature, but there aren't many of them and they don't bump into each other very often. So that means altogether, there's a relatively low energy. And so, they glow at best faintly as a as a composite, all the all the particles together. And that's why the corona is so soft and delicate in its brightness compared to the blindingly bright photosphere. So I hope that's a, a little a little foray into solar physics to help you understand where I get my numbers from. Um, the spacecraft themselves uh, are, are really quite fun because they all have their own website. I've listed a few of them here. Um, and most of them, uh, as soon as they take a picture, the data comes down by radio to NASA. They do a little uh, analysis on it and then post them on the web. And so you can go and pick out today's images already from SOHO in visible light of the photosphere. Uh, x-rays and other uh, wavelengths. Solar Dynamics Observatory is doing that as well. And they produce daily movies, which are sort of fun. Um, my favorite place to go for solar weather, for all of this information and sort of one-stop shopping is spaceweather.com. Here's uh, an image of the photosphere taken today, February 1st with the numbers of the sunspots indicated. I think you can click it, yeah, and get a larger size image. They have lots of nice little stories about what's going on. Sunspot numbers currently 75 today. Talks about when the sun has not had any spots on it lately. Talks about the radio light coming from the 
uh, surface of the sun. Uh, sometimes they sell things on balloons that are floating in balloons in near space. There's just so much stuff on here. It's a lot of fun. They, they talk about space weather, how the sun's solar wind and the gusts in it are creating aurora borealis in Canada right now. You can even sign up for uh, alerts, go outside and look at the corona, uh, at, at the, the, uh, the borealis. And here's an x-ray picture of the sun with coronal holes and sunspots that was taken today. So it's just a fantastic place to, to kind of get all the things uh, that you might want to know about the sun and its interaction with the earth. I'll mention if I forget, I've got a few slips of paper over here with some of the uh, websites that I love so much. Uh, so feel free to please take one and, and play around, investigate yourself. Um, one last thought about spacecraft. Um, I mentioned that all of these spacecraft are sort of couch potatoes staying home back in the safety back here uh, near the Earth. The Parker Solar Probe is the Voyager, the adventurer. Um, here's a picture of it. Um, you can see it's got little tiny solar panels and a radio to send its information back home. Um, and it's got this big shade because its job is to go to the sun. Um, so it was launched a few years ago from the Earth. Uh, the outer circle here is Earth's orbit. Um, it was put onto an orbit so it flew close past Venus and used Venus's gravity to slow down and fall towards the sun. And it's been doing that over and over again, uh, orbiting around the sun, encountering Venus periodically and losing energy to move closer and closer to the sun. Um, and as it flies close to the sun, closer and closer with each pass, it's now uh, working its way towards inside about 10 times the radius of the sun, so 10 solar radii, quite, quite close to the sun. Um, and it zips past there and it takes direct measurements of the outer parts of the corona. Um, and I figure I'll leave off my talk uh, or get close to finishing my talk uh, by sharing you with you a video uh, from the Parker Solar Probe as it rides through one of these solar streamers. Um, I'm actually gonna jump out of here for a second. There we are. So it's a short video and I don't seem to be able to slow it down. So I'll just show it to you a couple times. Um, here we are, the sun is off in that direction. You can see the Milky Way just passed through. There's a couple of satellites up there. Um, and the spray of, I don't know, it looks like raindrops or snow passing your windshield. Um, that is actually uh, electrons and protons, subatomic particles in the solar wind, part of this streamer blowing away from the sun. And they're interacting and, and hitting the camera, the, the digital camera, and leaving uh, sort of those funny trails. And so it gives you the sense that it's in a very uh, sort of high energy, aggressive environment uh, with blasts coming out. You can see a few sprays of, of uh, gas. Show it to you one more time and point on the screen rather than waving my hands. Uh, sprays of gas coming out over here um, as, as uh, mass is thrown off the surface of the sun by solar activity. So I figured that was just sort of a fun ride along um, to, to give you a sense of how uh, visiting a star can look. And I think I'm probably about at my time limit here. So I'll throw up my uh, references and in particular, uh, give my thanks to Fred Espinac and all his beautiful eclipse images. Um, there's a great book called Totality over there. Um, take a look at it on your way out if you like. 
Um, again, I've got slips of paper, so if you'd like to take one of those with you. Um, the totality book uh, is a nice, complete description of uh, eclipses, and it costs only about 20 bucks, so the price is right. Um, and there's spaceweather.com. Um, so let me open the floor to questions, and uh, thank you very much. And as, as people kind of get tired of questions, uh, I'll, I'll show a few videos if you'd like to stay. But we'll start with a question back there. Yeah, they're they're plastic and they have cut into them uh, too small to see a large number of lines. I think probably uh, 300 lines per inch or so. Um, and what happens is when the light comes, the white light, the mixed light comes into it, it interacts with those lines and diffracts or bends uh, into the different colors or wavelengths of light, the blue, the green, the red. Um, and so it's it's very much like a glass prism would make a spectrum, but it's uh, it's cheaper and easier to make. Um, and it, it actually works better than a prism in many ways. So it's, it's the way that we do it uh, sort of in astronomy, I suppose. Good question. Others? Yes. Um, I think I have a couple of questions. Okay, yeah. Um, so are the coronal holes that some spots are uh, The coronal holes uh, actually are where sunspots are not. So the sunspots are under the, the loopy parts that are shining brightly. Um, if, yeah. Well, this is the photosphere in visible light, in the light that your eyes would see, and the, the magnetic field loops lock the gas there and it cools and darkens, but above them, the gas, the lines wiggle and heat uh, and, and cause the, the, the gas to shine more brightly. Okay, uh, I'll get back to this. The second question is, what will happen to the partner? Is it, uh, is it is this probe going to crash on the, on the sun sometime? That's a good question. Um, I, I should be repeating the questions out to the audience. What's gonna happen to the Parker solar probe? I am not entirely sure. Um, even though it's going through the outer layers of the sun, it doesn't get slowed down very much by that. There's not a lot of friction there. So it probably will just continue to orbit after it, you know, runs out of fuel uh, after, after the equipment fails. Um, I, I think they had designed the mission to be about seven years uh, in total. But a lot of times NASA missions go longer than they were expected. And so they'll keep gathering data as long as the instruments are functioning. Um, it may be that in, in hundreds of years or thousands of years, that gradual slowing effect uh, caused by friction with the sun's outer atmosphere will cause it to spiral into the sun and be fried. But um, it, it, it will last a long time as a, a physical lump of metal. <laughs> Okay. Um, so we astronomers look at the surface of the sun every day and, and they number the, the spot, mm. so they count it. And you showed, you showed that um, graph mm -hmm. uh, where um, the, the maximum or sunspot, uh, and then the minimum, and in, in this way, okay, you can, you associate the minimum or the maximum uh, respectively with minimum associated with uh, the dipolar, mm -hmm. yep. brush, yep. and the, yeah, the, the, the maximum is associated with the flower kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. So, is there something of real substance to, for our knowledge about the sun uh, when we make these associations with the, the 
Corona. Yeah. Looking yeah. Corona. So the question was uh, the the patterns, the the maximum flower shape and the sunspot minimum uh, sort of equatorial streamers and brush dipole shape. What's the bigger picture behind that? Um, I, it's it's telling us it's expressing um, the shape of the magnetic field that the sun has. Um, and I guess maybe that's a good point to, to sort of talk about that. Um, at sunspot minimum, um, I, I mentioned that there's that sort of shape, that dipolar shape as if there was a bar magnet in the sun. Um, but we think that the, the dipole shape of the magnetic field is uh, caused by something else. It's caused by the rotation of the sun, the 30 day rotation of the sun, and the convective motion of rising and falling gas, sort of like boiling uh, in a pot. And those two motions together of electric, uh, electrically charged electrons and protons um, creates magnetic fields. And so it's the same way we think that the Earth's magnetic field, the same shape of a dipole uh, within the Earth is created by the rotation of the Earth and the convection of metal uh, molten metal in the core. So it's the same thing, but unlike the earth, which rotates like a solid ball, right? The sun is all gas. There's no solid part of the sun, even inside. Um, and so it turns out that the equator rotates faster than the poles. It gets ahead and it twists the magnetic field lines, the simple dipole shape into ever more complicated and convoluted ropes of magnetic fields, kind of, you know, you think of a twisted braided rope, uh, you get that sort of structure and it gets tighter and tighter twisted until they snap. And that causes the explosions, the flares and the coronal mass ejections. And that twisting uh, also produces at the surface of the sun, the small, scale loops that jut out of the surface of the sun. And they twist and reconnect and flare and explode and produce showers of X-rays that go out as space weather, clouds of gas that go out through the solar system and collide with the earth sometimes and cause the coronal borealis, cause power uh, grids to collapse because they induce strong electric currents uh, in, the, in the wires that connect across the countries. Um, they can block out radio and things like that. So in fact, when I was a graduate student 40 years ago, um, one of the projects that I worked on was trying to predict how strong the next solar maximum would be. I was, I was hired by the Department of Defense to predict if radios were gonna go out, right? Uh, and, and suddenly communications goes down, right? So everybody wants to know when, when communications go out or when these high energy effects are gonna happen. So, um, so it's a, a practical problem in many ways to understand what's going on with the, the shape and structure of the corona and the shape and structure of, of the sun's magnetic field, a public good, I guess we would say. Um, so I hope, I hope that covers your question. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Yes. So if you follow those brush line poles mm. and follow those curved lines they started all the way out, does that would that take you all the way out to the tenials? That's a really good question. Um, it, it's complicated a little bit by the polar streamers, which which create what's called a current sheet, uh, sort of a, a, a plane. It's, it kind of warps and wobbles um, where uh, there's positive uh, magnetic field on one side and negative on the other, and, and current can flow along that interface between them. So it gets complicated, and I'm not quite sure what the answer to your question is. How far do these loops have to go out before they wrap around and completely come back underneath? I think it's it's quite far. I couldn't say whether it's Mercury's orbit or Earth's orbit, or I think it must be before that. Yeah. Or does it go all the way out to outside 
the planets and, and that heliosphere that she spoke of, the outermost reaches of, of the solar system where the sun's magnetic field is sort of bumping up against magnetic fields of other stars nearby and in the interstellar magnetic fields. I'm sorry, I wish I could answer your question better, but it, it kind of puts in everybody's picture the immensity of the, the magnetic field of the sun and how it, it threads through the whole solar system. Great question. Yes. So you said that with each eclipse, the corona looks different. Yes. For 2024, for any of the eclipses, is what viewers in Mexico see the same thing as what we see in Ohio? That's a great question. Sort of, the, the, what is the time scale of the changes? Um, it's slower. So over the course of the the day when the eclipse is playing out, we probably won't see much variation in the shape and structure of the corona. Um, but maybe this is a good time to quickly play one of those videos that I promised for you. Um, where have you gone? <laughs> Sorry, folks. Got too much going on here. Um, maybe it's back here. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. So this is the uh, corona graph from the SOHO spacecraft, disk blocking the sun, streamers. Um, I've got it set up to play slowly. And so you can see the time clock down here. It's 2003, October 19th, and the hours and minutes running by. And you can see these coronal mass ejections going where a flare has happened at the photosphere and it's blowing gas. The, the, the magnetic loops are expanding and, and breaking away and causing gusts. There's a beautiful one gusts in the solar wind as mass is actually thrown off the surface of the sun um, in the form of electrons and uh, protons, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, helium atoms uh, are actually flowing away uh, and the sun's mass is getting smaller a tiny bit as that happens. So uh, you can see, you know, it might take hours for one of those coronal mass ejections to pass away, and you probably wouldn't see the changes during an eclipse. Um, but we've got plenty of other good things to look at during the eclipse, so <laughs> we'll enjoy that. Great question. Time for maybe, maybe one more before we wrap up. So is the next eclipse going to be something like the sunflower? I think if the sunflower is my prediction. Um, if you want to cheat, you can go on one of these daily, uh, uh, you know, the SOHO website and see what the sun is, you know, the hour before the, the eclipse. But I'm not going to do that. I like to, to wait and see what nature gives for me. Great, great. Thank you all very much. Um, feel free to come by up here and, and have a look. Um, we've got glasses. We Feel free to take glasses. If you do take glasses, you might want to put them in an a envelope or something like that uh, because the 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 lenses of the glasses, if they get torn or damaged, you do not want to use the glasses. We hesitated a little bit to give them out so far ahead of the eclipse, but treat them nicely. They'll treat you nicely. <laughs>